a nation. The growth, development and successes of a nation are truly that of the people. As Nigeria marks her diamond jubilee independence, it is a great time to roll out the drums and celebrate. To celebrate Nigeria's independence, yes, but much more to celebrate the progress of the people. We are stronger together. An essential ingredient of togetherness is connectedness. Information and Communication Technologies, ICTs, is today the harbinger of connectedness. It has turned the world into a global village. It has reached every nook and cranny and impacted more Nigerians, regardless of their sphere of life, than any other one thing. The history of the development of telecommunications in Nigeria started way before independence in 1960. It actually began in 1886 when a cable connection was established between Lagos and the colonial office in London. By 1893, government offices in Lagos were provided with telephone service, which was later extended to Ilori and Jeba. This formed the nucleus of Nigeria's national telecommunications network. In 1923, the first commercial trunk telephone service between Itu and Calabar was established. Between 1946 and 1952, a three-channel line carrier system was commissioned between Lagos and Ibadan and was later extended to Oshobo, Kaduna, Kano, Benin and Enugu. By about 1960, a manual telex exchange of 60 subscriber lines was in service in Lagos. External telephone services in the pre-independence period were wholly owned by Cable and Wireless of the United Kingdom, which was a colonial private company. With independence in 1960, the country was able to create its own plan for phone and telegraph development. I had an uncle who was a confidential secretary in one of the offices in Lagos. In fact, city, Lagos City, Lagos City Hall, what you call Lagos City Hall now. And uh, I loved the idea of coming to his office. Reason, he always gave me the job of helping him to get dial tone. Dial tone was the tone you needed to get before you can dial into the telephone. And somehow it was getting delayed and that was delaying his work. So while his boss was telling him to get this for me, get that for me, he was also at the same time asking him to produce work. It was becoming difficult to do both. So he would be very happy to invite me to visit him and I will be helping him to get the alto. The country established the Nigerian External Telecommunications Net to take over external telephony the fixed telephone lines grew from 60,000 to 90,000 in the 1960s and to 116,000 in the 1970s. NITEL, Nigerian Telecommunications Limited, was formed in 1985 as the merger telecommunications division of Post and Telecommunications PNT and NET and NET. NITEL was formed to improve coordination of telecommunication services within the country, to make internal communications more commercial in objective, and to reduce duplication of budgetary allocations and investments. NITEL started life as a virtual monopoly. It was operationally inefficient. I recall that NITEL was the incumbent. Um, NITEL was uh, the in charge, so to say. United determined the direction of the industry, United determined everything uh, for the sector. And it was a time when to make one international call, you have to take a queue, take a tally and be on a queue, the United Exchange. Sometimes you can be on the queue over a period of two, three hours, and God help you when it's your turn to make a call. If your called, called party is not on seat or the connection suddenly go off, you have to go back to the end of the queue and restart again. Uh, and it was very difficult. Were very difficult. Um, 
mobile phones were almost non-existent. Waiting time for telecom telephone service at the time was almost two to three years, depending on where you were. And we had at that time the Minister of Government who even said categorically on national television that telecommunications were not telephone was not meant for the poor. I went to graduate school in the United States and literally could take a week of my mother going to NITEL uh, every day and waiting for a few hours um, for us to be able to have a conversation. So things were particularly difficult in terms of our ability to communicate in real time. For liberalization to actually succeed, it was important that government broke the monopoly of NITEL. NITEL didn't want private operators. And it was so bad that to interconnect with NITEL, uh, we have to pay for the trunks to connect, interconnect with them. We have to pay them for calls originating from them and terminating on our network. We have to pay for calls originating from us and terminating on their network. And so, so bad that we had to build an, a, a, an exchange center at NITEL facility, which was called the PTO room, private operators room at the time. We paid money as private operators to build the center. We paid both our own equipment. We paid for United to connect us with the trunks. And what will interest you is that for us to access the building, the building which we paid for, we need to seek clearance from United to access the building to do maintenance. It was as bad at the time. Looking back now uh, to those days, it's almost as if, hey, how did people survive, right, or cope? But um, NITE was a, a state monopoly. There were challenges with it, in, 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 with what we see now. For instance, one of the biggest challenge, which we all wish as telecom service providers that was done during the NITE era was uh, implementation of a strong Telestra backbone. All the problems we are facing today in terms of uh, broadband connectivity, fiber, all that infrastructure, if it was already there when NITE was a state monopoly, the industry would have made much more progress because it's as if now we are trying to put basic infrastructure that should have been there years ago. In 1992, NITE sought to go digital with the introduction of mobile telephony in 1992 through MTS, a partnership with Atlanta-based Digital Communications Limited. A lot of private telephone operators, PTOs, emerged in Lagos during the 1960s. Intercellular and Multilinks became leaders in this space. The PTOs, sadly, had to depend on an unreliable NITEL for interconnectivity services. In addition, they had to compete with their regulator. It was poor services all round. Over the next decade, NITEL suffered botched divestment efforts. The telecommunications sector as we see today is a key beneficiary of the liberalization policy of the Obasanjo presidency. In 2001, Orushegun Obasanjo, Chief Orushegun Obasanjo's regime saw there was a mistake. Liberalize, privatize, do what Oftel, which is now called Ofcom, was doing. And those policies have led to where we are right now. The crossover of government from military to civil rule it actually coincided with the time when GSM was being aggressively marketed everywhere. The GSM was presented by its proponents, its vendors, it was presented as if it was an African solution. That if we wanted a technology that Africans will use and it will connect us, that uh, GSM was it. That was, that was the story we read about their strategy. And um, Nigeria bought into the story and we managed it very well. Indeed, Nigeria's ICT sector is an outgrowth of the GSM network's rapid expansion. When we look at where Nigeria is today, we have indeed made a lot of progress and we can see the impact that having access to real-time telecommunications is having in our lives and our economy. I think it was important uh, and for history that that auction was as transparent as it was 
uh, because no doubt um, we were not a country that people were willing to do business with at the time. We just came out of long years of military rule. Uh, government had given licenses and they had cancelled licenses over newspaper, radio announcements and all that. And so international players didn't consider Nigeria as an investment destination as it were prior to that time. But with transparency we had from that auction, I think it changed the perception of the international community. Yes, though a late entrant into the GSM market, Nigeria has outpaced many countries across the globe in terms of market size and telephone penetration. The first GSM service rolled out in August 2001, following a successful digital mobile license DML auction conducted in January of the same year by the nation's telecom regulator, the Nigerian Communications Commission, NCC. That auction, the first in Africa, was adjudged transparent and world-class by both the World Bank and the International Telecommunications Union, ITU. At the end of the auction, each licensee paid $285 million for the license. Econet and MTN started immediately, while MTEL fluttered and fell by the wayside. Two years later, Globacom joined the party, and Atisalat was a late entrant in 2008. Nitel, the resurrected Nitel and MTEL, kicked off in 2014 but still trying to find its feet. Today, less than two decades after, Nigeria now has over 180 million active lines from the 450,000 that Nitel offered. I think the, the biggest, which we can't um, deny, is the availability of mobile telephony. The, the, beyond the traditional contribution to the GDP, which I believe is in the neighborhood of 14, 15% as of this year, that the telecom sector adds to the economy. Beyond that, just the quality of life of the citizens uh, that has been improved uh, is significant, you know. I remember uh, in the early 2000, 2001, 2000-ish, where we just had uh, a state monopoly, you know, running the telecom sector and how restricted we are in terms of being able to make just basic phone calls, you know. Now that is is gone, you, you know. We've now seen some progress where today you can do your business without even leaving your house, have access to your banking services, have access to uh, pretty much everything you need, you know. Uh, in the comfort of your home, good entertainment, and also the quality of life of the citizens have been greatly improved uh, by that. But I would think the biggest contribution, you know, to the um, um, country uh, over this period of time is in the availability of mobile telephony, because it has it leapfrogged us. We, we suddenly we, we moved to become the number one telecom market in Africa. You know. Even countries that were ahead of us, like uh, South Africa and others, we look from them. The moment mobile telephony became prevalent uh, today, and all the services that were not benefiting, whether it's the uh, OTT services, the broadband connectivity, all that is only possible because we we have availability of service across the country, no matter the challenges being faced in some places. In this period, thousands of well-paying career jobs were created with millions of ancillary jobs and countless economies of scale, including the sprouting of GSM cum ICT markets across the country. GSM has not only created jobs, it has created wealth and empowered many lives. In about two decades, the telecom industry has grown from a $50 million sector in investments to over $75 billion, with over 15 trillion naira paid to the Federation account in taxes, levies, and dues. Before the emergence of engineer Ernest Ndukwe as executive vice chairman of the Nigeria Communications Commission, who has been roundly praised and commended for his sterling leadership qualities, there was His Royal Highness. As a engineer Ogbonna Kletus Romantus, 
who successfully developed a solid foundation as the Pioneer Executive Vice Chairman, EVC, in 1993. You just mentioned Ogbo Nai Roman too. Yes. You can mention Olawale Ike. You can mention, because he, he was the minister at that time, and he bought, he bought the idea. You can mention Engineer Vincent Maduka. Yes. Apart from being my chairman of the committee in, within Nigerian Society of Engineers, he was also the consultant that eventually midwifed the creation, the liberalization process. I mean, these are, these are selfless engineers. These were people who came with the determination to, to save a country. During the time of Undukwe, the network was expanded. It was a commission that knew its stuff, knew, knew its mandate, and faced it very squarely, and of course selflessly. You see, it is not just facing things squarely that matters, but facing it selflessly, I came to realize it's very, very important. But the other EVCs, and now Professor Umaru Dambata, have followed the same path. So what NCC has witnessed over the years is continuity. If only we can have policy continuity in government, in most of our industries, the gains will have been sustained. It's policy of a sort that leads to a, lot, leads to a lot of failure in our industries. With the coming in of engineer Umar Gabba Dambata, he was a man that was part of the story. He hit the ground running and he sustained the gains he met on the ground. Now, if you talk of number portability, it's been sustained. If you talk of telecom infrastructure, become a national infrastructure is putting on the fight. You talk of battle for right of way charges reduction is putting up a good fight. So all the gains of yesteryears have been sustained and that is why the success story has not gone down. They have proven that there are strength and excellence in local content. Professor Umaru Garbadambata the Executive Vice Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, EVC and CEO of the Nigerian Communications Commission, NCC, is a seasoned telecommunications professional. Since his appointment as the NCC CEO, Professor Dambata has made tremendous success in transforming the telecom sector. He has superintended over appreciable and visible progress in the areas of infrastructural development, consumer empowerment and satisfaction, research and development, improved stakeholder relation, and a significant increase in active mobile broadband penetration. We need to quickly do something to address the infrastructure deficit. I think that is an important area that, you know, the NCC has to do more and do more quickly. Another area is in the area of regulations. When you have a pandemic of the type that we have, do we have the regulatory framework that will address this development, okay? In addition to infrastructure, solid infrastructure, this developmental regulation, all these are some of the pillars of the digital economy policy and uh, strategy uh, roadmap, you know, unveiled by Mr. President um, Mamadou Buhari, GCFR. We should take a deep reflection on the fast, what we have done in the fast, what we are doing presently, you know, with a view to defining a trajectory for the future, a trajectory of social and economic transformation of the citizenry. In the same year that GSM operators opened shop, an indigenous firm, Zinox Technologies, commenced operations with a vision to be the leading and preferred source of ICT products and solutions in Africa. As Zinox grew, it became synonymous with technology solutions. In 2007, the Dr. Leo Stan-led Zinox team was responsible for the technology infrastructure of the 2007 voters registration in Nigeria. The firm performed a similar feat in 2011 and literally saved the elections and delivered in what it considered the largest single ICT project in sub-Saharan Africa. There would have been crisis in the economy uh, if elections don't have facts and figures. 
and uh, we did that with the DDC and then did authentication with the card reader so that first of all before you vote you they confirm it's you okay so it's an id structure of course the story of connectivity is not complete without a mention of the progressive role played by min one min one sweetened the ploy improved the story when it among other things launched a subsea cable commenced metropolitan infrastructure and established its data center ecosystem. One of the key or primary objectives of the plan was to achieve 90% coverage of the population with broadband services. Um, that was defined as 25 megabits per second download in urban areas and 10 megabits per second in rural areas. And to ensure that at least 70% of eligible populations have access to broadband services. So as a fundamental, that really says all across the country, um, you have access to broadband services. In addition, we set specific objectives for broadband um, coverage uh, in schools. Um, we expect all our tertiary institutions to have access to broadband. 50% um, of our secondary schools, 25% um, of primary schools, uh, our health facilities, all of our local governments across the country to have access to broadband. Um, affordability, because we want uh, low-income groups to also have access to this. Um, focus on digital literacy, um, digital identity. I think those are some of the key elements that tied um, the, the plan together in terms of outcomes that citizens would directly recognize. There are also some policy and infrastructure uh, recommendations that support the achievement of these objectives. But these are the targets of what we really set out to achieve. Today, Main One continues to grow its footprints with major network interconnection facilities, extensive terrestrial fiber build-out, regional points of presence, and the delivery of services into 10 countries in West Africa. The firm is working tirelessly to increasingly empower and drive growth and development. Without a doubt, Main One is uniquely positioned to situate the West African region on the global digital connectivity map. We have worked to deepen uh, internet access, not just in Nigeria, to, but across West Africa. In Nigeria, today, you have internet penetration rates greater than 50% uh, of the population, uh, which I think is incredible over the past 10 years. In addition, prices have crashed considerably because when we came in at the first instance, we crashed wholesale prices overnight for data access by over 50%. Um, today, those prices are probably less than 2% of what they were before we landed our submarine cable and there's been phenomenal growth. In addition, we're bringing content to our continent with deploying um, data centers. And so today, um, greater than 50% of internet traffic accessed by Nigerians is being made available to them from local data centers of which we are one of the key providers. Naturally, with growth comes new challenges. As the number of internet users grew, the challenge of internet traffic domestication emerged. To keep local traffic local and help the continent save on cost, Internet exchange points have been established across Africa. In Nigeria, Internet Exchange Point of Nigeria, IXPN, was set up and quickly gained government parking. IXPN is a physical infrastructure that allows internet service providers, ISPs, and network operators to exchange traffic between their networks with ASN, mutual pairing agreements with the aid of the IXPN. Nigeria is said to have saved about $40 million, which is about 15.2 billion naira in the localization of internet traffic, 
which would have gone abroad. When we started operating in 2016-17, uh, the traffic was less than 1% you know, that is local because there is no website that is hosted locally in Nigeria and no content provider that is um, within the shores of Nigeria. It has increased within the last 10 years from less than 1% to almost 70%. So almost 70% of our traffic is now local. So a typical service provider before now, when they connect to the internet, almost everything goes out. Now, 70% is going local, 30% is going international. Because it's going local, the cost of data for that particular ISP has significantly dropped. This has brought about almost over 400-fold growth of local traffic. The increasing number of data centers is also a big plus. Dr. Chris Uwaje is widely known and regarded as the oracle of the Nigerian IT industry. He pioneered the framework and strategy for the National Information Technology Development Policy for Nigeria, which became the premise for the establishment of the National Information Technology Development Agency, NITDA. I was privileged to have written about nine chapters, only 13 chapters or sessions of that um, thing that were put to peer review of stakeholders. And of course, the adoption came and it was a fantastic thing. That is where NITDEF was created in 2001. NITDEF is a national information technology unit under the Ministry of Science and Technology because the enabling framework for the legislation has really not come. It was a policy construct. So from NITDEF, we progressed assiduously and of course uh, with all stakeholders being you know, in support we were able now to tender for a draft bill for the establishment of national IT bill and various acts, including Government Paperless Act, uh, Digital Signature Act, uh, uh, Information Technology Development Agency, and all that stuff. But it becomes so cumbersome that uh, Dan Sadao, who was the chairman of Senate, now advised us to split those act into various sections and move way forward. So we took the NIDA Act, and that is why finally in 2007, the NIDA, Nigerian IT Development Agency Act of 2007, was enacted. Consider software. Software propels the engine of ICT infrastructure growth. Software associations and bodies are working tirelessly to promote local software. I think that there's a transition that we're all going through and that we need to recognize the wins as well as the losses. Where we have succeeded, we should speak to those issues. And where we haven't succeeded, we should ask ourselves. So, and, and, and just to use a simple one example, look at the, the, uh, the uh, single treasury accounts and the emergence of Remita as a platform. System Specs is a, is a company that is over two decades old with extensive experience in the space in which it was operating around human resource management and all the issues concerning payroll and pensions and all those sort of things. They had decades of experience in that space. They had built out their own solutions. They had piloted solutions at the national stage. They were responsible for initial pilots around the IPS platform. And as a result of that, and this is a big lesson that all of Nigeria, particularly policymakers, should, 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 should leverage off of. There is no way that a company could have come from outer space and implemented an IPIS. It was the result of sustained investment of human resources over 25 years that produced Remita as a uniquely Nigerian solution to, to a global problem. And as a consequence of that, they were able to take that and go beyond Nigeria to other countries and be able to sell that Nigerian solution, Remita. It didn't exist anywhere. They didn't import it from anywhere. They built it on the basis of their own expertise over a period of time. And they came up with a solution that is currently managing a national platform for the country. If we were less 
focused on uh, some of the other narratives. This is one of our biggest narratives. In the government circle, Galaxy Backbone is providing leading solutions. It is today the IT and shared services provider of the federal government. Well, uh, the vision of the Galaxy Backbone is uh, to be a leader uh, or that will enable uh, the, the digital inclusion okay, for uh, Nigeria and in fact for the whole Africa. It has the responsibility of building a common services platform consisting of in-country and offshore VSAT hubs, a data center, a federal capital metro fiber backbone, and multiple redundant internet gateways. Major challenges of infrastructure in Nigeria, you can count maybe some of the things. One, maybe you will say right of way, which has been a kind of a difficult situation as it is. Right of way before, you will see that, um, you know, the lands are supposed to be under the, the, the state government. And you know, laying down your fibers and what have you has to fast through all these uh, state governments. And each and every of the state governments have different way of uh, somehow allowing for this right of ways in terms of uh, the monetary ban because they are getting the tax out of it. So you can see you will have a situation where many states uh, see this as a way of uh, revenue generation. Galaxy Backbone plays a key role in the development and deployment of technology initiatives and services in government. To strengthen the transparency, the efficiency and quality of public administration service. One of the most ambitious technology projects of government over the last two decades is the National ID Scheme. From our own mandate to create the National Identity Database, I can say that we are now able to create and manage that National Identity Database, which is the foundation of the identity system, and it is growing steadily. Essentially, players in the ICT sectors seek and explore creative solutions to fill gaps left by the state. It is no wonder then that ICT firms have since been established in the far-flung fields like energy, agriculture, banking, transportation, logistics, health, and finance. Employment is key. Training is key. Um, to, is a, is a, to contributing meaningfully to the economy. So we must, we must always uh, uh, focus on human capital development. Nigeria is largely a cash-driven economy. Nearly everything is cash and carry, but the rising cost of printing, handling and management of cash is making it an unsustainable system. Senator Ayo Arishi founded Cards Technology Limited in 2000 and went on to build the first third-party processing facility in Sub-Sahara Africa for MasterCard International. This paved the way for the issuance of MasterCard by banks in Nigeria, thereby opening up the opportunity for Nigerians to participate in e-commerce as we know it today. So the very first idea of using an electronic POS terminal actually was developed by us in Cast Technology. So we got some of those PS terminals from Israel called Norit. And that was the very, those were the very first set of PS terminals that we used in the banks. And so immediately people, foreigners, got wind of the fact that, okay, this was working in Sheraton, was working at a, a co-hotel. We were the very first pioneers in this, in this uh, business. But shortly after, Actually, before we could even take off, the banks had come together, about 12 of them, to set up InterSwitch. And InterSwitch focused on the domestic issues. We focused on international payments, you know. Uh, it was really uh, a great pleasure that I was able, 
at that time to play the role that we were able to play in the industry. As a pioneer, I was privileged, you know, to put something down that has helped our economy. The good news is that the government has not been dwindling its thumbs. In fact, it is perhaps the biggest driver of electronic payments, e-payment, either directly or through its agencies. In 2012, the Central Bank of Nigeria, CBN, introduced the cashless policy. The aim was ostensibly to ease this dependence on cash and promote digital payments. Soon afterwards, the federal government directed that all federal ministry and agency accounts be consolidated under the Treasury Single Account TSA scheme. Remita by System Specs was chosen as the preferred platform to collect revenue on behalf of the government. This year, the coronavirus pandemic and the attendance containment protocol, including the lockdown, also drove people to digital channels like never before. The pandemic has brought a number of things to the fore. The world has seen a disruption of value chains in a manner that the world has never seen before. It has demonstrated the concentration of risk inherent in concentrating manufacturing or production capacity in one country or in one region. It has demonstrated the need to deliberately take advantage of technology to ensure that whatever happens, life and business can still continue to operate. There have been preparation for the unknown. We should have been more prepared than we were when this pandemic hit, with the result that um, in government attempt to get on top of this, we should have played more prominent role at that beginning than we did. I did not say we did it, but we should have been more at the forefront, leading from the trenches with government. And I think eventually we caught up with that. But what we think that should happen is that we should be more prepared for the unknown that can happen any time. This wouldn't be the first or the last pandemic. It can come in different shapes and in different forms, but we should at least try to be more prepared for it and then be more impactful. We tend to be very focused on today. What needs to be get what needs to what needs to be done today, the problems that we're facing today, and we don't think so far ahead in terms of uh, what tomorrow may look like. Um, and even if you were to envision five years, ten years, twenty years, you would always have these events like these these black swans. You know, if I may use the term, that come in and disrupt anything, any plan, any you know position or forecast that you may have made. And that leads you to the second principle. Um, which is about agility. That as, as a country and as an industry, we need to be agile. Ability to respond quickly to things that happen within the environment that may be unexpected. One thing is clear, ICT to the rescue. With um, Zoom, Teams, yeah, a bunch of them, even Facebook, WhatsApp, all of them are coming to the rescue with you know, providing access to people or uh, providing resources, communication resources between homes and uh, dwellers, between offices and staff, between different governments and the people, because whether you look at it, whichever way you look at it, brother, it's ICT that's essentially carrying the world now. What we have seen so far is that communication is the infrastructure of infrastructure. Uh, it is an, that the infrastructure upon which many social economic services depend. And what we have now seen from COVID-19 and the experience following is that without telecom infrastructure, the economy of the world will have grounded to a halt. I think that the, the, the benefit of ICT cannot be emphasized. The reality of the pandemic has sunk. We are all compelled by circumstances, you know, we have found ourselves, you know, to do what we can to contend and contain the effects of the pandemic. And it has also cast an important attention on the telecommunications you know, industry. 
You know, the uh, reason for this is that a lot of activities are now virtual. And the question to ask is, is the telecommunications industry ready to contend with this reality? I don't see the world going back to pre-COVID era. I think that world is gone. Uh, there may be changes in the traditional way we live going forward, but the pre-COVID world is, in my opinion, gone for good, you know. There are some services and activities that we can't just go back to because um, uh, COVID and the way COVID has been managed has made people realize that it is a lot easier, you know, to live in this tradition, new way than the past. You know, most recently we are all still watching the U.S. election where they had record number of people voting for the first time in their history. Because people could now vote remotely, people could now do mail-in balloting and others, which in the past, the traditional way of going to queue up on election day restricted the number of people that could vote or be able to vote. And we're going to start seeing this in maybe in some other countries where they now acknowledge that uh, remote participation, if well managed, you know, and if the technology to make it happen exists, then it's a better way. The e-payment sector of the fintech ecosystem may well serve as the growth frontier of the new decade in Nigeria. Banks and payment fintechs like Interswitch, Paga and First Money are built to benefit significantly from the emerging e-payment revolution. Many of the achievements that we were able to make here, many of the developed countries have not gotten to the level that we were in maybe about two, three years ago. And of course, the idea of e-payment generally, or the mobile phone, or e-transfer, all those, you know, SMS, we were right there. And as we speak today, I will tell you that the, uh, the level of sophistication in our banking industry is at par with most countries in the world, if not better. E-education. As every aspect of our lives has lately been influenced by digitization one way or the other, the application of ICT to education brought about the concept of e-education or e-learning. Today, WhatsApp and Telegram classes are quite popular alongside delivering lectures via television and radio. While it is said that what is wrong with education cannot be entirely fixed with technology, technology would go a long way to ameliorate the situation. School is now beyond the school wall. It can take place anytime and anywhere. Seedmark Technologies Luminate for Schools is a leader in this rapidly growing field. Luminate for Schools gives educational institutions a platform to set up teaching and learning activities online. We developed it and incorporated the challenges of COVID into it, and it is, an, is a learning platform that encompasses primary, secondary, and tertiary. And it is called Luminate. It's the rave of the moment right now, and over 100 schools have signed on to it. And we're still taking it to government and others to say, listen, we can make this a standard. And guess what? We threw some AI over it so that the data can be crunched, the planners can see what they're doing, and you can follow the progression of children from primary to secondary to tertiary in one fell swoop. So you can plan, you can extrapolate, but you can also look back to see the pattern. And what are we talking about? The currency of today, data. Luminate is going to change the face of learning, teaching and testing in this country. It enables schools to create their own learning content and teach from anywhere. It empowers schools to connect teachers with students and continue classroom activities, assessment and engagement like always. In the area of e-registration, which we pioneered, I mean, we can beat our chest to that. It has served and continues to serve the nation meritoriously. 
go to jump today, go to YF today, and even the National, the National Youth Service Corps. And guess what? In line with that also, we didn't stop there. We got engaged and partnered with the Nigerian Educational Research and Development Council in Abuja to digitize the Nigerian curriculum. They also help capacity building and consistency, learning retention, and they are quite measurable. Agriculture. Government after government in Nigeria hap on agriculture as a priority area. The government's priority sectors offer a fertile ground for scaling up technology use. Experts point out that productivity in the sector is hampered by poor access to inputs, credit, and markets. With most farms of the smallholder variety, mechanization is a crucial step in improving efficiency. Agriculture Agri-tech startups are seeking to solve the logistics of food waste in the country. For instance, Farm Crowdy is a digital agriculture platform that supports rural farmers by providing them with farm inputs, trainings, and easy market access for their farm produce. Farmers want to sell their produce. We've built platforms now to help them to sell their produce better. So now they're able to connect on our platform and then make it available to major off-takers to buy up from, um, from us. Farmers need insurance. We have mobile apps that are helping them now to get the right kind of micro insurance for them to protect their investment in the farms and then also protect their lives and their properties. Across the food value chain, in the different things that a farmer will need or anyone involved in the food value chain needs to get done in an effective and efficient manner, technology can play a role in that, in reducing how much errors you get from that and it gets the results you're looking at. So, technology is enabling fund sourcing, strengthening the value chain and improving access to markets. It is equally enabling the provision of extension services the digital transformation of the Nigerian ecosystem has been remarkably tremendous as there has been a huge increase in entrepreneurship growth inspired by digitization. Startups doing business in different sectors of the economy, both online and brick, are springing up in different sectors. ICT is everywhere and in every business. The ICT uh has come to stay all over. It has uh, uh, simplified greatly the way we are doing things. With the pandemic, now people have learned virtual meetings. E-learning has become more popular. Um, you can do meetings uh, wherever you are. Uh, likewise, people now realize that you can work from wherever you are. People are oblivious of the fact that ICT is the oxygen of Nigeria's economy. We are the reason Nigeria still exists. Take out communications from Nigeria, will there be a Nigeria? Take out NTN, take out Airtel, take out Blue, take out Nine Mobile, take out Main One, take out all the I I I I ISPs. There will be no Nigeria. ICT is the reason Nigeria exists. The biggest unsung hero in the growth of the Nigerian ICT sector. In this space, several individuals come to mind. These individuals are the invisibles that made the sector visible. They operated beyond the call of duty. They promoted the sector, explained the workings, and expanded on the opportunity. They were the loudest critics, strongest advocates, and staunchest defenders. They believed when few others even understood. They saw the future and invested their strength, intelligence and platforms. They gave their all every time. The ICT media hero. You cannot begin to talk about the revolution of the ICT industry in Nigeria without acceding at least 70% of the contribution of the ICT publishing people or those who report the sector. Because, tell me, who sets the agenda? Who challenges the government? Who talks about even the regulatory environment? The licenses that were issued? Who paid 
who did not pay, who defaulted. All the challenges about what Marisa and Rio Habacha did in issuing about 17 so-called GSL licenses which became illegal, which were cancelled. Who talked about how the digital mobile license auction of 2001 January became a global example, a global benchmark, something that was midwived by the NS Indukwe-led Nigerian Communications Commission. It is the media. Without the media, nobody will know or probably know what was happening in Nigeria outside of Nigeria. And in fact, even investors became more 